Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, Mike Simonson on Twitter. I'm a web developer. <laughs> I uh, am one of the maintainer of Doctrine for those who know the tool. I'm also the organizer of Brussels PHP. If there are people from Brussels that are interested, uh, or if there are people that uh, know any company that is willing to host us. Uh, I'd be very happy to talk with you after the talk. And I also uh, worked at uh, Cube Solution. Whenever I'm not behind my computer, you can probably find me hiking somewhere outdoor. Um, now that that part is done, uh, what do you mean, white screen? No, it's apparently. Wait, sorry. <laughs> nope. Uh, I can. No, it's apparently the best I can do. So I suppose everyone here uh, is a PHP developer, um, but uh, who here uh, is used to doing TDD? Uh, at work. Okay, quite a few people. Um, who is doing TDD like for more than five years? I mean, that is quite experienced. Okay, I hope I'm I'm still gonna uh, give you a few tricks. But uh, this talk is basically everything that I've learned along the way, going to conferences and uh, meeting. Uh, people from very different backgrounds. Uh, for instance, maybe some of you know Drawer Helper. I'm probably butchering his name, but uh, it's a C-sharp developer that uh, gives a very similar talk in C-sharp, but most of what uh, he learned me is applicable in any language. And uh, if you wanna learn stuff about unit testing, he has definitely very interesting stuff to say. Um, who here uh, works agile at work? Also, pretty much everyone. Who here uh, works, I mean, the boss, their boss says that they work agile, but in fact they just do waterfall? Okay, so. <laughs> As I said, that, that talk is going to be mostly about my experience, but, uh, I think it's <laughs> a lot of you will, uh, based on your answer, a lot of you can relate to that experience. Um, my first experience with unit testing was at school, uh, where basically we were more learn, we were more teach how to delete the test that just failed because we changed some piece of code and just do something else, like test another part of the code uh, than anything else. Um, in a way, I could see that it might be useful, but it was very frustrating. Um, after school, I, I went to a British company uh, I, for my internship, and there they really practiced uh, TDD the right way, I would say, or at least the first uh, useful way that I had seen. Um, it was a very interesting uh, experience for me because that was the first time that I could see someone developing new code using TDD uh, in a way that wasn't cumbersome and wasn't just making me waste tons of time not doing what, uh, not knowing what where I was gonna go. Then I uh, I went to my first uh, bait job. Uh, it was a very 
big company with lots of developer, uh, and apparently no one was interested into building uh, code that actually worked. So I was I was mostly trying to do tests myself, but I was the only one to run them. I was also the only one to write them, and the only one to fix them because. I was the only one to notice when they break. Um, that was also very frustrating, uh, but yeah, life goes on and I changed job uh, to go in a much smaller company where I was uh, heavily encouraged uh, going to conference like FOSDEM, and that's basically at those conferences that I learned uh, most of what I know now. I'm mostly going to speak here about unit testing, but that's just one part of all the tests that you can do on your application. Uh, but before to speak about the different uh, kind of tests to see where the unit test stands, there is also the pretty obvious question like, when should we test? Uh, it's always a cost-benefit question uh, at some point like the product has to ship and you have to get paid. So <laughs> you have to know when to test and when not to test. Uh, most of the time, I'd say that it's rather a question like, is that project going to live on after I finished working on it? Like, Am I going to give that project to this project responsibility to someone else? Is someone going to maintain have to maintain it? If the answer is yes, then it's probably a bit I mean, it would be nicer for him to test it. It's gonna simplify the job of the person that comes after you a lot. Uh, especially because we live in an industry where we are asked to build prototype and all those prototypes end up in production. So if you want to know when to test, basically ask yourself the question if you want your project to succeed or not. The unit test in the wall uh, <laughs> test uh, scene is, is basically the one that is at the bottom. It's the test that is the closest to the logic of the code, the one that is the fastest to run because it has the least dependency. If your unit test has a lot of dependency, it's not a unit test anymore. It's basically a functional test or an integration test. Uh, and the fact that it's fast to run because it has no dependency make it cheap to run and make it interesting in the sense that if you run those tests a lot, then they are going to be useful. The only good reason to write a test is for the test to fail. If the test never fails, the test is just useless. It's just wasting time and space. Um, I suppose everyone has seen a unit test. Uh, here the example is in Java, but it's pretty much the, the same in any language. You just have a method in some random class that is marked one way or another either way with uh, an annotation or whatever else exists in your language that is similar to annotation uh, and does the same job to, uh, to, to mark that that method is a test. What that gives you is effectively the fact that you can have a piece of code that can detect that automatically and you don't need to program that part of the work. It's just going to pick up whichever test you have anywhere in your, uh, in your code and run them automatically. It's a contract between, between you and your uh, unit testing framework. The first issue that I had uh, when I was in that big company trying to implement or, and run the test myself was that I, I didn't really knew a lot of tools that could help me and uh, now it's, it's really easy to use any one of them. I mean, they're all over the place. Any unit testing framework has its own test runner. Uh, you also have a build server that you can install to run your test on a separate machine. 
and you can even implement in really simple fashion a script that picks up every time you change your code and run the test. Uh, that way you don't even need to, either way, go out of your IDE. If you use one and run the test, it's just going to happen automatically. You can have on one screen your tests that are constantly running and work on the other uh, without any issue. The build server is also important because as opposed to what I was doing, uh, it gives a way to show the test result to the other person in the team. I was the only one to run them, so I was the only one to notice when they failed. It's like, if someone cannot see the result of the test in the team, obviously it's not, that person is gonna forget to run them at some point and then forget to use them completely. So, Installing a build server, if you're more than one person in the team, feels like uh, a necessity to me. Uh, it became really easy now. Uh, there are templates for PHP projects in Jenkins. Uh, I suppose everyone knows the Jenkins. Uh, it's really easy to set up now. You should definitely do it. There are also ID runner for whichever ID that you use there is probably a test runner that's already integrated in it and can provide additional functionality like just run the tests that cover uh, that piece of code. Um, yeah. Now, writing those tests. <coughs> you can basically be in two different situations. You are either way writing tests for a brand new project or you're writing tests for existing code that you have to maintain. Let's face it, there is way more projects to maintain than new project to do, even though there is a, a lot of, of new project to do, but like, uh, I suppose every one of you has had to maintain a project at some point, uh, and it's the bulk of the work. If you have, uh, New code, it's obviously going to be easier to start doing TDD on that code. Uh, and in that case, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, BDD tools, behavior driven development tools. They are basically a little bit the same, uh, the same kind of tool that we have for unit testing for the code. They have the same behavior but for the person that actually asks you the feature of that code. So by, by writing scenario in a behavior driven development, it's gonna guide you on what unit test you should write so that you can write the code that fulfills <laughs> those unit tests and fulfill those scenario. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about those tools. There is a lot of documentation available pretty much everywhere. If you're looking for one in PHP, uh, there is BHAT for instance, but there are other. Uh, it's just the most well-known. Sadly, if you are not in that uh, case, most probably your code will have dependencies. Like often when you look at uh, blog posts that describe how to do TDD, they use a calculator example. Uh, it's really nice because it's really concise, but none of the code that I wrote uh, is actually so dependency less than a calculator. Um, and as I said previously, if you have dependencies and you use them in your unit tests, it's gonna make the test slow. It's also going to be really hard to set up across the machine of all, uh, I mean, reliably set up across the machine of everyone that's on the team, especially if you have people that are on Windows, others that are on Mac and Linux. And it's also going to be a pain to set up on the CI server if you have one. Some of those dependencies are a little bit more subtle than others. Um, often people don't realize that the time is a really annoying dependency. Uh, and I remember uh, that when I was in London, one of the tests that I fixed was a test that failed six months on the year and it was basically just uh, 
an issue in a date calculation that wasn't taking into account the um, daylight yeah the daylight saving time. It's really hard to figure out that it's the issue if you don't see the time as a dependency of your code and try to extract that dependency in a very explicit way. One of the ways that I've seen people uh, deal with those dependencies is uh, creating what's called fake object. Um, it's really simple to do. Here you have an example with the migration class of Doctrine Migration. It has a bunch of methods, and if you need to create a fake object for that, you just extend migration and uh, override all the function, the, all the public function of that, uh, of that object without uh, putting anything in the body of the function. And you have just an object that is really similar but doesn't do anything. Um, it's really easy to do that like uh, if you start testing, but it's going to be a pain really, really fast because every time you will change something in the object that you extend, you're going to have to change it also in the fake object. That's a lot of code that you have to maintain yourself. Every code that you write yourself, you have to maintain yourself. And, um, and it's, that's it. Now, there is also who heard already about mocking frameworks? <coughs> okay, most of you, so I can probably go a little bit faster there. But it's basically a piece of code that will do that work for you automatically. So every time that you change something in your object, it can regenerate that fake object automatically. Um, it can also provide a lot of additional fu functionality on top of that. For instance, you can uh, verify that certain methods of your object have been called or have not been called, which is much harder to do if you implement the fake object yourself. Um, here you have a, an example of one of the mocking f uh, library that exists in uh, PHP. It's called Mockery. Um, there is also uh, a lot of other, there is Prophecy and even PHP unit has its own uh, mocking library, but uh, Mockery has very interesting uh, feature, like for instance, one of the things that's annoying when you have a lot of stuff to mock in your code um, is that sometimes you have to create a lot of mock objects that return each other until you have actually mocked the dependency that you wanted to mock. And you can do that at once with mockery, uh, which is nice. Although it, it might mean in the first place that your code has a problem of structure if you have so much to mock. But if it's just code that you have to maintain, it's a really quick fix. Uh, before you can refactor that piece of code. Any question yet? Nope? Okay. Um, now, um, I don't know if anyone heard about auto-mocking container? No? Okay, I'm going to learn you something. Sadly, that's not something that exists in PHP yet. Uh, at least I've, I, I, I couldn't find any implementation, but... Um, it's that idea that in most framework now, uh, they have a dependency injection container that you configure so that it can create the object that you need in your application. And they reuse that container to automatically uh, generate uh, mocks. So because that dependency injection container already knows how to build the actual object, it can really easily create that object only passing its uh, mocks. So you have actually the real object, it just uh, cannot do anything on its own. Um, now the, the time dependency. Uh, the solution to, to fix the time dependency is basically to pass the time every time you need to use it. If you have 
daytime now anywhere or daytime without any parameter anywhere in your code, it's going to make that piece of code really hard to test. Uh, and you should probably pass that information uh, at, uh, at, uh, at creation time. So it looks like that a uh, uh, piece of example is, OK, sorry. Um, this is actually showing how you can, you can do that pass the time uh, without having to change too much. If you do it at first, you can implement an interface, a clock interface, that just returns the current time. And uh, then you can implement two class, a system clock that just do that, uh, return daytime now, and a mock clock that, and a mock clock that is going to return the time that you decide in your test. OK, I'm sorry for the order of the slide here, but yeah, the first one was showing the problem. <laughs> but um, here, by passing the clock and asking the clock the current time, we have actually fixed our dependency issue to the time. If we have any test that needs it, you, we can just replace uh, the system clock by uh, the mock one and pass it the time that we want to use in our test. Uh, it's mostly useful if you are making calculation, but it doesn't take a lot of time to implement, so I would recommend to take a look at that solution. Now, it's all good, but we also have a big problem in the documentation of this of the, the unit testing framework in general um, because they never really explain you how you should structure your test or sh how you should write them because you have that freedom in that method of your unit test where you can do anything you want um, yeah it, it's maybe a little bit hurtful in that sense. Um, and often the, the, the information that you can find, at least in my opinion, uh, make you end up in, uh, with tests that are really hard uh, to maintain. Maybe we can uh, come back to the definition of, the, of a unit test. It's an automated piece of code. That's a really important one because uh, at the, the company where my girlfriend worked, uh, they had unit testing that they told her uh, while they hired, hired her. It was just some person with an Excel sheet file that was just running the test by clicking on the button in the interface. That's not a unit test. It's a unit of work of the system. Um, that one is really hard to define. Uh, I've not seen anyone yet that could give me a proper definition of that. Um, the only thing that I can tell you is that, to me, uh, a unit test, it's a test that tests the smallest possible blocks of code. And you can check that if you use uh, code coverage. Often, you will see people that use code coverage as a sort of a vanity, uh, uh, vanity thing on their readme on GitHub. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have 100% code coverage. But that doesn't give you any indication on the quality of those tests. Uh, if they are easy to understand like, what they're actually testing and if, you're, if it's going to be possible to modify them or not. That test should check one and only one assumption about the code. That one is a really important one. As a doctrine maintainer, I sometimes read pull requests where we have tests that are like 200 lines of code, and you will see someone that do something, then assert something, then do something else, then assert something else. And it's actually impossible to understand 
what he's trying to test or what he's trying to do in that test. Test one thing, put what you're testing in the name of the method and the person that comes after you is going to uh, love you. It doesn't actually still give you a lot of information of uh, the structure of the test. Yeah. Uh, as I said, one of the important stuff to test the quality of a test is to make it fail first. If the test didn't fail, you can never be sure that it actually tested what you expected it to test. That's something that happened to me countless time, writing tests, thinking that they work, and never see them failing because they were actually not testing what I, I thought at all. As I told you, the code coverage, which is the really way better use trying to determine what you're testing than trying to give you a good feeling by showing a high percentage. Uh, the, the best way you can use the code coverage is trying to cover only one test you run, one test, and you see how much code it's covering. If, if it's covering hundreds of lines, it's not a unit test anymore. It's probably going to be slow, and it's going to be much harder to understand what it's trying to test. Okay, what is that example? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that's the test that he's trying to test. No, that's another problem of the code coverage. Often, you can end up with 100% code coverage and you think you're safe. Except that in that case, you can write three tests that will, co will give you 100% code coverage, but they're not giving you uh, they're not testing all the possible scenario uh, that that code can be in because um, actually maybe it's better asked like how many tests do you think you have to write to cover all the scenario of that example so who says three <laughs> who says four five six 27. Uh, how do you reach that number? <laughs> 3 power 3. I think it's 3 uh, factorial. But I'm not sure. I would say it's 3 factorial 3 to be sure that you pass in all the if and then one more because you could pass in none of them. But anyway, it's that, that piece of code could give you the impression that your code is tested and it can still end up in a situation that you did not expect. How can you detect that? It, like, it's really hard to know if your test is good and the only tool that can help you do that is mutation testing. Any, any one of you heard about uh, mutation testing? Okay, quite a few people. Um, for those who don't know, um, again, it's the idea to try to use the code coverage in a slightly different way. Uh, we have a, a PHP tool to do that. It's called Humbug. It's actually going to run your test using code coverage, so it can map each test with a piece of code that it's covering. And uh, based on that, it's going to change logic in your actual code. It's going to randomly um, change greater than into lower or equal and that kind of change that are actually uh, syntaxly correct, but will change the behavior of your test. And then it runs the test that cover that piece of code. And there can be only three solutions. Either way, the code blow up. The test catch the failure or the test doesn't see anything. And it's actually that part that interests us. Um, if your test did not catch a change of behavior of your code, it, I mean, it probably means that the test is not that good. The, the problem of that kind of tool is that because the changes are randomly generated over your code, 
uh, you have to inspect the change that it did because it could have uh, no actual change in behavior. It's just the syntax that change in PHP, but that's something that you have to go through manually. So it's quite slow, but it's still very useful um, to, to determine if your tests are good. As I said, because it's going to try to map your code to the piece of code that is covered by that uh, test, if each of your tests cover hundreds of lines, it's going to take forever to run that kind of tool. And it's going to be even harder to uh, try to interpret the result of that tool. So for instance, on Doctrine, we cannot run it because it would actually take pretty much a month on my machine. <coughs> so we have a lot of work to improve the test. Now, on the actual structure of the test, the best advice uh, I've got, this, this comes from Drawer, actually. Um, it's, I don't know, a bit weird that I could never read about that anywhere, but uh, I hope that you're going to find it interesting. Um, you can read about that everywhere. What is AAA? Anyone, does anyone know what AAA, triple A is? Sorry? <laughs> yeah, that's also batteries. Uh, in the field of unit testing, AAA is um, that idea that you should have three uh, parts in your unit test, the arrange, act, and assert part of your test. Um, it basically means that in the arrange part, you set up something, then you act on it, you call a method on that uh, piece of code, and then you assert a certain result on it. So here we are building just a, a collection, adding an element to it, and then checking that the element is effectively in the collection object or not. Um, the problem is that there is no way to enforce that kind of stuff. Like you really have to read your test and see if they're actually following that guidance or not. Um, it's just a guidance, so it might not work everywhere. So far, uh, for me, it has always worked, but maybe someone has an example where uh, it might be not so useful. The arrange part of the test. Here you can see uh, an example where uh, in the arrange part, someone is actually creating two automobiles, uh, then uh, painting one of them and, uh, no, sorry. Yeah. And asserting, wait, what is it that's doing? So, <laughs> someone is creating two cars with two different colors, then painting one with the, with the color of the other and checking that in the end that the color uh, was effectively uh, painted on that second car. Can anyone see any problem that uh, could arise if you write the test like that? Like it's respecting the arrange act assert, but if you have that kind of sorry, if you have that kind of test, um, over time it's probably going to be an issue. Can can someone see why? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So your object is probably going to evolve, and you might decide at some point that having the color as a string might be not the best ID, and you change your automobile to pass an object that represents the color, for instance, or change anything else in the constructor of the automobile, and you need to change all your tests. You need to adapt that everywhere in all your tests. So to fix that, the advice that you will see everywhere is, oh, but it's easy, just use the setup method. Every unit framework uh, 
every unit testing framework provide that kind of facilities, uh, one method that will get called every time just before running your test. It works, but it has two issues. First, it means that now all your tests have a dependency on that setup method. And if at some point one of the tests make a change to the object, it's gonna, it might affect the following tests that can run. We have fixed for that now in PHP unit, uh, and most of the time it shouldn't be an issue because it's actually PHP unit that's gonna make a new instance of the uh, unit testing class and call the setup and call the, the next uh, test in a compl completely uh, separate fashion, but still, you could end up in situation, especially when you're trying to mock databases and stuff, where one of the tests do a change that gets persisted, and then uh, the next tests are affected by it. And now you're in a situation where the order in which the tests run is actually important, uh, so that they don't fail. And when they fail, you have to start like binary testing all your tests to find which one is causing the issue in your test suite. Um, I've had to do that a few times. It's really painful. Um, so I would advise against, uh, against using that. The other issue is that although here it might seem like your code is dry because you are only creating the automobile at one place in the setup method, and then it magically gets called everywhere. If you have a few hundred tests and you just read the test, you just see objects that you don't know where they come from that they get that get calls, and then an assertion is made, and it becomes that much more easy, harder to reason about the test. Dry, in uh, so dry is a for those who don't know, dry is a technique which means don't repeat yourself. It tries to uh, make sure that you refactor your tests in a way that you don't write twice uh, the same piece of code in the same class, for instance. Or at least that's the way a lot of people understand it. That can be a whole other discussion. But that's one of the reasons people use the setup method. Uh, because then they don't have to write new automobiles everywhere in their test. If you have that test in the middle of a file and you need to scroll at the top to find the setup method, if it's at the top and not at the bottom or somewhere in the middle, it's just a pain to understand how your tests behave. Um, so the next solution that I've also seen, maybe I removed that example. Um, yeah, extracting to a method to the extreme is also uh, hurtful for your compression of the test uh, because we've had clients that ended up in a situation where their, all their unit tests basically look like that. Initialize, do, and then assert. Again, having that test or not having it is pretty much the same. Now, the solution to that problem that you might maybe uh, no, the builder pattern. Who knows the, who heard the, about the builder pattern? Okay. Um, I don't know why, I've never seen anyone use it in unit tests, but it actually makes the unit test that much more readable, and you still get the benefit that if your code changed, you have to change it only in one place. Um, for those who don't know, the builder pattern is just an object that will create your object for you. So here, the automobile builder um, just uh, has a, a, a build method that will return uh, your automobile. On its own, it might not seem uh, very interesting, but if you use that with a fluent interface so that you have methods everywhere in your builder to <laughs> change how you can, uh, or change the parameter that you can build your automobile with, 
then you end up with tests that are much more readable. You actually have uh, an arranged part of your test where you can limit yourself to only specify the stuff that are important for your test. Um, it's not done here, but you could totally imagine that you have a create builder method, but also a create builder with default values that I don't care about. And then on top of that, you just change the part that is important for your current test. The assert part of the test, um, again, can anyone see a, a problem in the assert part of that test? <coughs> yeah? If there's an error, the test will not will run through the whole collection. It will stop prematurely. Exactly. So maybe you might have heard that, that your test uh, should only have one assertion. Um, it might be not always the case in the sense that there are some good reason to break that rules, but there are no good reason to put an assertion in a for each. Um, if you start putting logic like that in your code, at some point you're just going to need to unit test your unit test to understand, to make sure that they're actually doing what you think they are doing. Um, so as a, as a base rule, um, it's recommended to only assert one thing. The other reason to only assert one thing is that um, all the unit testing framework throw exception when the assertion uh, fails, which means that all the following ones won't be run and you won't get a complete picture of what's wrong in your code. Now, one of the good reasons that I've seen uh, to actually have more than one assertion is, uh, for instance, uh, testing uh, an exception. If you need to test the code of the exception, but also the message, it makes sense to do that in one test. <coughs> but if you write it like that, again, um, if it fails at the error code, exception code, you don't know if the, the message is still the right one or if the message is also uh, in a weird state. It's just an example. There might be better, um, but it gets the, the job done. Uh, to fix that issue, there is the concept of assert all. It also exists in pretty much any unit testing framework. Um, and it's just that idea that you can write yourself an assertion that you pass assertion to it, and it's going to run all of them, even if one of them throw an exception, and just <coughs> re-throw the exception that were, uh, that were thrown in the first place uh, at the end of your list of assertion. Yeah. For some reason, uh, I see also a lot of people that want to religiously stick with one assertion type in all their tests, and they have assert true everywhere. Um, although that completely works, um, it makes the default error message completely useless. Uh, when you end up in test suite that breaks a few hundred tests, and the only thing that you can find out of those tests is assert true but was false. Uh, yeah, I mean, if the tests weren't there, it was, to me, it's pretty much the same. Um, so picking the right assertion for the thing that you're trying to test means a better error message. And that's what <laughs> is going to help you fixing the error in the first place. We are only writing tests so that they fail. So when they fail, it would be nice if we could get really fast a good idea of what's the actual problem in the test. And also people get the parameter order often wrong. So supposedly um, most of the unit test fr testing framework I've seen, the first parameter is what you expect and then 
uh, you pass the actual value that you are testing. If you get that in the wrong order, it's also going to make the error message really confusing. Um, now, another way to have better uh, assertion, I've, uh, it's also something that I've not seen implemented in PHP, but there is no reason why it couldn't be done. Uh, and maybe it exists and I've just not find it. It's a library uh, that exists in C Sharp and in Java, um, and it's called Shugli. And what Shugli allows you, um, it basically will change your assertion from the one that's on the top, assert same red and then get color, to something like color should be red. When you read the test all the time that you don't spend doing that whole gymnastic in your head like, oh, the first parameter is what I should have and then the second one is what I'm testing. It's a lot of time that you are not wasting by just having it spelling spelled out directly in front of you. It's, it's pretty much English. Uh, yeah, to me it makes the code, the test, much more readable. Um, they also... Uh, they also have a very interesting concept of uh, equivalence where you can say that two objects should be equivalent but you can exclude some of the property of the object. So here in the example you for instance use a UUID in the constructor of your object. Um, <laughs> if you try to assert that those objects are the same in your unit test unless you have a setter to set that ID to null it's just never, it's just gonna fail all the time on the UUID. Um, in that case, it also makes the test to me super readable. It's very clear that the customer should be equivalent, but the ID. Does anyone has uh, any question? So what is your question exactly? How to write code that use dependency injection or? Yeah. So your question is what is dependency injection or? No, no, I, I should probably have asked a question, um, but uh, yeah, who, who doesn't know what dependency injection is? Okay, maybe people are shy, but um, um, there... No, it's okay. Um, the idea of dependency injection is just that idea that instead of doing stuff like that, where the UUID, for instance, is just created using a static method, um, which make it impossible for the person that looks at your code to know that it actually has a dependency on a, a UUID library. Um, instead of doing that, you make sure that everything that is used in your code is either way passed to the constructor if it's necessary at construct time or is passed to the method that uses it. Um, in any case, using dependency injection, in my uh, opinion, is going to make the code more readable uh, because just by looking at the constructor, you directly know what is necessary for that class to actually do its job but it's also going to be easier to test because in your test you can override all those dependencies uh, easily, whereas it's much harder if it's a static call or impossible. Um, any other question? Yeah. Same object you get, that has changed. 
Uh, to be fair, it's just an example. Maybe it's not the best, but um, to answer uh, part of your question uh, that is about the fact that it's testing at the same time the paint method and the get method, um, I would not expect the get method to have any logic in it. So uh, it would be weird that it fails. It's totally something that could happen, especially if it's uh, code that you didn't write yourself and code that's existing and that you're trying to unit test. But there, it's, it's just an example. Um, yeah, that is maybe not the best. Yeah? Um, you mentioned earlier on the very fine. Uh, I have heard a lot of comments about uh, people saying that when you use verify a lot or you do a lot of partial mocks, you're actually uh, making, uh, you're, you, you have a unit test. So basically, you are really uh, dependent on your implementation. So if the implementation changes a little bit, then all your tests will break, but the unit still works. How do you see that? Do you, do you think it's still valid or? That's right. we, should, we should try to not do that. Maybe I did not insist on that part enough, but mock is uh, uh, a fix for a code that is already problematic. If you have to use mocks too much uh, and everywhere, it basically means that your code is structured in a way that everything is dependent on everything. and that make it super hard to test. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Something is going to change somewhere, and all the tests are going to break. Uh, mock is, is only there because you have already existing code, and you're trying to test a small part of it. Um, it cannot fix all your code at once. Do you think that verify uh, falls into that same category of problem? Because once you verify that uh, the real method is run inside that unit, what do you mean by verify? So, uh, for example, I have a, a unit test and want to put a method, and then I'm verifying that some methods that probably in that unit will run, mm -hmm. for example. But then someone comes along the line and refactor that method. So the method still output what it was doing before, but that method is no longer there, and now you verify in fact. Yeah. Um, maybe I should uh, use an example where it's actually useful, but in the case that you are uh, showing, it could actually be a problem. Um, I have a hard time finding a, a good reason to use Verify just like on the spot now, but um, I've seen an example where it was partly justified. Um, I just cannot find a good one just now. Um, we are out of time. Sorry. Um, thank you very much. Uh, have a good talk.